Um, we're going to turn to the broader credit markets now, and we're very fortunate to have Jonathan Ward, who's a partner at Stevenson Harwood. And Jonathan is obviously a very active member of this marketplace and actually has been a veteran of the credit panel uh, for, for many years with us, and we really appreciate uh, his involvement. So I'm going I'm to turn it over to Jonathan to introduce his panel, and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Good, good afternoon from uh, a locked down London. Um, I, um, our topic today is, is to look at um, today's uh, markets uh, with a special focus on, on uh, ESG, and that's been really interesting. And we're gonna cover a number of uh, themes. We're gonna uh, compare green finance with sustainable uh, linked loans, how they work and who can use them. We're going to look briefly at uh, ESG reports that certain of the uh, uh, borrowers are, are issuing. We're going to look at technology risk and avoiding what is termed as stranded assets. Um, we're going to look at chip finance generally, um, how it's doing in 2021 and what we foresee happening in the rest of this year. And we also will touch on some um, institutional issues for institutional investors um, giving support to uh, ship finance uh, in, uh, uh, banks, in particular one of the panel members. So um, I would like to introduce you to a very strong panel uh, and senior panel uh, today. I have Jörg Goebbels uh, from uh, ABN, Global Head of uh, Coverage and Transportation. Um, I will have Peter Zhao from uh, ICBC Financial Leasing when we uh, saw the technology out. Um, he, he'll be joining very shortly. I have uh, Philip Wunschmann, from, uh, Head of Shipping from Berenberg. And I have uh, Holger Appel, um, Head of Shipping at KFW Apex. So uh, some very senior uh, bankers with a lot of experience. And um, I'm pleased to say a lot, um, a lot to discuss, a lot to say on, on our themes. So I thought what we would do is just uh, kick off by uh, looking at uh, green um, uh, finance because we, we can't talk about sustainable linked loans without talking about green finance. So here we're talking about the true green, fi green finance that's defined uh, um, by the G20 Sustainable Finance Study Group as quote, the financing of investments that provide environmental benefits in the broader context of environmental sustainable development. So here, the purpose of the financing is to actively support a project that will benefit the environment. Sustainable uh, finance, on the other hand, um, this is financing of investments in the, the, that take account of the ESG, the environmental, social and governmental considerations. And here the financing might have something uh, not necessarily aimed at benefiting the environment, but but the borrower will be pursuing um, um, its, its purpose of the loan in a more sustainable way by trying to ad address greenhouse gases, tackling pollution, uh, minimizing waste, and uh, uh, improving um, efficiency generally. So there's a slight difference between a true green finance and sustainable finance. But um, I'm going to turn over to the bankers because the, these guys are doing the deals. So I'd like to turn first to um, Holger. Can you tell us a bit more about green loans and shipping and, and what sort of things you are involved that, that, that are green, green shipping, please? You're on mute, Holger. Okay, now it works. Okay, wonderful. Well, first of all, great to be with you today. Of course, it would be much better to see you in person at in Hamburg, like we did as we did last year. Uh, but but anyhow, it's a wonderful opportunity to to be with you to, to share some insights. Well, I think the the, the history of green loan goes back to uh, well uh, well as initiative um, from from the. Uh, LMA. Um, it comes along with four core principle, uh, principles I will show with you in, in a minute. Uh, but prior to that, there was also um, the establishment of the green bond principle. So there's always, uh, how should I say, uh, cooperation between capital markets and syndicated uh, lending. And um, I wouldn't say, Jonathan, as you did, that the green loans are the true stuff. <laughs> they are just different. 
uh, I would put it that way. But one of the essential um, um, uh, earmarks of, of a green loan is that uh, the funds are dedicated to a specific investment or a specific project. So in this sense, I would say they are more more tangible because you could really see where the proceeds are being invested and which which which, which uh, um, asset or which project um, you will hopefully um, render the the effects which which are uh, are financed by this by this green loan. Uh, referring to those four key principles is that as as I alluded to the use of proceeds you have to have a specific project which contributes positively in the sense of maybe like saving energy or um, reducing pollution or avoiding pollution at all. It could come along with um, uh, water or wastewater treatment or um, uh, similar stuff. So um, first of all, you have to, you have to show that uh, the, the, the use of the proceeds come along with those effects. Um, then there's a, um, certain process for the evaluation um, and the selection of a of a um, of a project or an investment, uh, which is then eligible for a, for a green loan, and in, in this context, um, there's of course an interaction between the bank and the borrower or the real econ economy to to put it that way, and uh, I think one of the most important partners in this context is a third party giving a second. Opinion. So the term second party opinion here is very important so that also um, for stakeholders, for the public, it comes, uh, it, 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 it gets very clear that this is not something which is, can be considered a greenwashing um, exercise so that there's, there are real terms and there are real benefits to the environment. And so this assessment and this opinion from a second party uh, is, is very important. And ultimately, of course, there's monitoring and reporting on the on the project, which is also something that um, is, is done in cooperation between the borrower and the bank. And um, I think what is also uh, one of the essential things which which have to be mentioned is um, it, it needs a lot of partnerships. I mean, first of all, the banks can help, the banks can contribute, but it's the real economy who um, then obviously has a strategy. Of course, you also need regulators. I come to that maybe later. Um, and so it needs a lot of a lot of efforts from very from various parties to um, make a green loan and of course a green investment um, a successful one. Okay, that's that, that's 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 very good. Um, yeah, yeah. Tell us more about the sustainable side and that, that you've been looking yeah. at. Yeah, I think I think sustainability linked loans eh, are uh, following from uh, the sustainability linked loan uh, principles that were published in 2017 by the LMA, and uh, they relate basically to the company's overall corporate uh, and social uh, responsibility C CSR. Um, I think sustainability loan linked loans um, motivate uh, clients to become greener or introduce other sustainability targets in uh, in their business and reflect that also in the loan that they attract uh, in financing the company it's often related to um, to aspects of ESG of environmental social and governance uh, KPIs that can be set quite uh, flexible and quite specific to each uh, case and company. Uh, for instance, it's very logic, of course, to link environmental performance to uh, to climate change, to greenhouse gas emissions, um, as reason. Uh, sorry, this someone has to go on mute. I think. Um, as, as, as often done recently re, uh, by uh, linking uh, uh, the Poseidon principles AER or EEDI uh, scores, um, embed that into the structure of the loan and into the pricing. Um, but it could also be around waste management or other energy efficiency. The social performance could be around uh, labor standards, um, uh, safety, diversity and governance yeah, could be around uh, 
do we have the right structure of the company in place, uh, tour tier structure, for instance, or do we have the right policies in place? Um, on all of these aspects, you could formulate certain KPIs, set certain targets that should be met, and then a discount, for instance, on the on the margin or a surplus on the margin uh, could be uh, could be uh, agreed upon. Um, I think it's fair to say let's, that. Let's explore that. It, I, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's explore that. So it is is the material benefit for the borrowers? Um, do, does it manifest itself in in a reduction in the margin? Is is that the main yeah. benefit for apart from general good no. a good thing to do? I, is there I any think, other financial yeah. gain? Yeah, I think I think one of the uh, clear tangible benefits of course is pricing um, uh, a lower cost of the funding but the other thing is uh, transparency of the company another important factor is um, investor diversification uh, by doing this you attract more banks more funds more bondholders perhaps uh, deeper pockets mm. diversification of your balance sheet and it probably fits very well with your strategy and, and marketing efforts. Uh, so there is more benefits than, than only um, um, money. <laughs> um, I, 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 I would fully agree yes. to that, uh, maybe just to step in if you allow. Um, I think it's, it's, it's rather to avoid a malus uh, than, than talking too much about benefit in concrete pricing, maybe first step. But, but avoiding the malus not to be taken into consideration at all, because I think that's the issue we, we, we see here more and more, that investors shy away from people who, who are not committed in, in one or the other way to some kind of, of scheme uh, going forward. And uh, I think we have seen that with the uh, odd fuel issue recently, that uh, the demand was, was very good. And uh, it can then, in the end, add to your pricing uh, if you have more demand yeah that uh, makes your pricing then more attractive at least in the public market yeah so do do do, we, do each of you um do each of you give a score in a sense a score to each of your borrowers to assess their um capability for for for, for lending did you have a do you scorecard people yeah so we, we do that, um, and I guess all the banks do that, uh, as part of their um, regular review or, and onboarding of clients. Huh? Mm -hmm. we, we make our uh, sustainability um, uh, index uh, internally, and we look at a wide variety of things. For instance, the ownership or the incorporation of the company. Um, whether it complies to local regulations, uh, what is the code of conduct? Is there a bribery and corruption uh, uh, policy around? Uh, is the company really committed to, for instance, sustainable scrapping of their ships that they have? Um, have they invested in balance water treatment systems? Um, have they joined certain organizations to to uh, to talk about and invest money in in um, in in improving their ships? Are they really committed to reduce emissions, NOx, SOx particles? Um, do they have do they have an inventory of hazardous material on of their ships in place? All these kind of things, and I can go on for an hour, but mm -hmm. all these things are assessed and and are rated uh, and also, by the way, shared and communicated with the clients to have a dialogue. And that's where a sustainability advisor role. Uh, comes in that we more and more take uh, increasingly so. So we engage with the customers on these topics in order to improve them. Well, I couldn't have said it better, and I just want to compliment what Job uh, just just said. Um, for us, um, the way how sustainable our clients conduct their business by any dimension is an integral part of our rating system. And what we've seen recently that the willingness and the, uh, the readiness to transform the company in the way the economy is transforming, and I would go as far as saying also society is transforming, 
due to environmental and other challenges we have around us, that's becoming more important. So we, we, we keep an eye on, on this in a wider context we don't, we, we, because we don't want to lose money <laughs> at the end of the day. That is, uh, I would say, the utmost uh, um, goal of, of each bank. But we're looking much more behind just figures. It's about strategy. It's about behavior. It's about, um, well, scope. It's also about um, how do you deal with your staff? Well, I, how, I was very interested that you have to decide how, how, many how many days of training do you give them? Huh? Um, um, obviously, now with COVID, a very lively topic is, is the crew on board. How is it dealt with? Um, um, but also, how do you embed sustainability or ESG topics into the, into the board or the supervisory board? Uh, do you make it a real uh, important uh, say in your structure? And and how are you finding the reaction of the uh, uh, the ship owners? Yeah, I I I think um, I think we've played. Oh, this... Sorry. No, please. You want me to start? Yep. Or yep. you go first then. Okay, okay. Well, you, I think everybody who's been in uh, uh, ship landing for some years know, knows we have a, a, a big variety of clients. We have listed companies, we have private owned companies, we have companies who are very advanced by any dimensions because, and we also have the, in a good sense, the good old icons uh, that we all have to take care of. And so, um, well, first of all, it needs, as Job said, a lot of communication. Yeah, you have to explain, but you also have to say, well, um, I ask you to help me to help you, to put it that way. So if uh, the company develops into the right direction, we can, of course, help them out with money, but also with some sort of advice. Um, and for me, I've been not been in shipping for too many years. It's quite striking. If I think back two, three years from now, how hesitant some of our clients still were to look into that matter and take that matter as serious as the rest of their business. And now I think it's taken off tremendously over the last two years. Of course, IMO 2020 has some impact. Those are people ultimately said, well, it's going to happen. I have to do something about it. Uh, but there are much, many more drivers in this context. Right. That's interesting. Um, can I ask Philip um, to give, give your perspective um, Particularly, um, explain the, the the nature of where you where you have some of your funding, the source of some of your funding, the investor requirements. That would be interesting to hear because you're slightly different from the other two institutions on 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 our panel. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Um, I think uh, you you know that we are a bank and also use our balance sheet, but to a lesser extent because it's it's not our key focus. So we have engaged in a way to work with investors and institutional investors, mainly from the European space. And uh, maybe just to, to elaborate a bit on that, there's not the only one uh, typical investor. There, there is a variety and it very much depends on the regulation or regular, regulatory scheme they are complying with. Um, for example, we, we still see differences between U.S. investors and European investors uh, these days. And even if I think the gap will be filled within a few few months or, or uh, 12 to, to 24 months uh, with the Biden administration and the topic being more prominent in the U.S. as well. But in, the, in Europe, we and we, this is our main focus, to focus on European institutional investors with our credit funds. Um, they are regulated by the EU, and uh, I think their their mo main concern today is this uh, what is called sustainable finance uh, disclosure re regulation. This this uh, what is is called mm -hmm. SDFR, and uh, this has been introduced in 2019 uh, already, but comes into force more or less this year, and uh, it starts in March now. Uh, with some uh, publication guidelines and uh, then it ramps up step by step into 2022-2023. And I think uh, the industry here needs to give a bit more attention to that regulation because it uh, uh, basically 
uh, forces investors uh, into a kind of disclosure regime where they have to publish certain data on, on their uh, investments. And um, uh, this includes insurances, insurance companies, pension funds, and all these kind of investors, which we all like to see in the industry, and also which the industry basically needs for the next generation of vessels. Uh, so the, the good news of that regulation maybe is that we have a certain set of standardization now, which I think we all like to see and must see, because otherwise it's too, uh, too much of effort. The, the bad news is maybe that this is uh, then a whole set of data collection which we all need. Uh, concretely, Jonathan, to answer your question, what, what do these investors expect from, from us as financial advisors? Um, I think on every single investment uh, and on their portfolios we might advise them on, uh, they need to comply with these what is called regulatory technical standards which just have been published by the EU Commission. And these standards define a number, I think 46 factors or and indicators on E, S and G and uh, make it as concrete as possible. And, and, and I think the investors need data to, for, from every investment they make on these criteria, yeah? which goes from what have been mentioned here, just simply decarbonization, greenhouse gas emissions, but it goes through water, it goes to waste, it goes through uh, social conditions and so on and so forth. So I think this is the first thing. We have to make an uh, impact assessment. Uh, so making making this ESG assessment a part of our credit decision. Uh, so it will be a new chapter in our, in our investment uh, applications for these investors. And last but not least, we need to implement a reporting which is uh, of, which is offered and provided to these investors, which they expect then to be standardized and, and also again uh, um, 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 having a lot of data uh, which we need and information which we need to provide to them. Yeah. That, that maybe gives the first idea it's, of, of, it's of what is coming here. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting you, you talk about standardization because the, this is the challenges that we're having this moment in shipping finance, isn't it? We've got um, the, the DAC 6 EU regulations about disclosure of um, tax structures. We've got LIBOR transition where different banks are doing different things. And now we have this other um, layer of ESG coming in and that, 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 that is making life rather hard for everybody. And I, I can see standardization being the way forward. Um, to go back to what Yep was saying, you, Yep, you were talking a little bit more about the social and governmental factors, the S and the G. Um, for all of you, um, is the um, apportionment a third, a third, a third, or, or, or is there more emphasis on the environment side than the social side? How, how does it work in practice? That's what I'm interested in. Yeah. Yep, do you want to go first? No, I think all three are equally important in the in the assessment uh, to to onboard a, a client or keep banking a client or providing any service to uh, to that client. All three factors are probably very important. However, the 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 the, the talk of the town is of course uh, greenhouse gas emissions and the reduction of it. That is uh, that's what the whole industry is basically. Uh, keen on um, new propulsion systems, new fuels, and um, the IMO regulations to to half our greenhouse gas emissions uh, very very quickly. Um, I think uh, the Poseidon Principle Initiative uh, by by a large number of banks and institutions is uh, is a big step forward. Um, the results are out of 2019, published in December uh, 20. Uh, this gives us a lot of data where we can uh, work on. Uh, we are at the moment trying to interpret the data. We're 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 making um, we're we're having um, engagement ses sessions with clients to understand the data and to, to understand the differences and see how they can uh, be uh, further developed. Um, uh, yeah. So so you know. These are all tools in the in the box that are developing and um, um, will uh, consequently in the next couple of years um, 
be further developed and then more KPIs and more tough uh, decisions will have to be made, obviously, by, by um, finance institutions. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So, um, Holger, uh, let me let me hear your thoughts on the 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 E the, the S and the G part. That's that's interesting. That what do KFW think? Oh, you're still on mute. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So you know that we as a, okay. as a bank with a government background take all these three elements very seriously, and they have been around for us for quite a number of years. Um, but of course, I would say the E is somehow the easiest one, yeah, because it's it comes along with a physical dimension. You can measure it, so you can set standards, you can compare the good to the very good, and so on, and can also look on on on, on a time scale. What are the developments and what you want to achieve? I think for for the S in particular, of course, you have to observe their minimum standards. Everybody should be after. But um, the relative valuation of the better in the context of the good or so is much more difficult. And it's also much more, I would say, a, a relative decision how people look at certain developments. So um, what is a, a very good payment in one sector, in one region, is a minimum wage somewhere else, to put it that way. Um, and I think for, for the G, uh, I would say there are universal standards, at least for, for European banks, which you, which you have to, to, to look after. So I would put it into that context. E is the relative easy one. G is a given. But for the, for the S, you have to be yeah, very careful um, what is the right level you can really achieve and what you see as, as the scale for your clients. Yeah, hmm. that's interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry, everybody. We, we haven't been able to connect with Peter Jow from ICBC Financial Leasing. Uh, the, the Marine Money team is working hard to try and connect him. But I, I do know that he had um, quite a lot to say about this area. And um, I can share with you, because uh, we obviously had a pre-conference call, that um, the Chinese institutions, and particularly ICBC, uh, are, are taking the ESG very seriously, and particularly the environmental side. And as you know, ICBC leasing are actually an owner of assets as the lessor. So they are they are taking this very seriously. And I, I want to move on to the next subject, which is talking about um, stranded um, assets. So um, l let's talk about this. Philip, what, what do you understand by the term stranded assets and what are you doing to uh, encourage your uh, ship owners, if that's the right word, encourage to, to um, make, make, make careful decisions. <laughs> Actually, I would like to pass this question on as, as we don't have, have been in touch with that topic uh, really uh, as Berenberg here. So okay. um, sorry for that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Would you like to pick up on stranded assets and, and the engine technology and whether the bank um, it has a policy of, of uh, uh, being very careful with uh, financing new buildings to, uh, uh, and what technology they're going to use. What, what are you doing in this area? Do you have any say or do you just leave it to the ship owners to make their decision? No, I think, uh, well, it's always the ship owners that make the decisions. Um, hopefully, they have a good base, business case once they do things, uh, and finance should be uh, the sort of last equation that uh, should be filled in. But um, obviously, we have our own, uh, when it comes to our own balance sheet, we have our own responsibility to manage that carefully. We, we're quite um, we're quite quite careful, I would say, with financing secondhand and older ships. Um, we have the we have the policy to uh, to have uh, to have ships repaid once they are 15, 16, 17 years old. Really, um, we're, we're we're keen on uh, financing new builds and, and young ships, um, preferably with a um, modern, um, efficient. Uh, uh, rating um, increasingly so LNG propulsed ships um, work very well yeah stranded assets I think it will with this Poseidon principle 
uh, for instance, and with other metrics, it will have a new uh, dimension, perhaps, because the question will be, is your ship going to be in compliance or out of compliance of um, of, uh, of all these um, regulations and uh, traje trajectories of the IMO and um, EU taxonomy and what have you. Uh, so, um, uh, it, 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 with 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 this um, uh, um, e development, if you like, um, stranded assets um, might might the, the the definition of it uh, becomes uh, a bit different, and um, yeah, uh, this is what we have to careful carefully manage in our portfolio, of course. A couple of years ago, we already worked, uh, started working with ride ships, and we have publicly announced we will not have uh, FNG labeled ships in our portfolio, and we'll move uh, towards a higher level of A and B, C uh, uh, rated ships in our portfolio, and that uh, that works quite well. I think um, yeah, very Jonathan. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, Jonathan, just just from my side, I think it's it's also a very fast moving target here still, and uh, I think with the IMO and the EU still weighing their regulatory, uh, let's say um, KPIs and what 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 they what they define as that, we will be uh, better answering this question by the end of this year. I think we have a very important year in front of us in terms of that, and it's a fast moving. Uh, target in this mm. respect. Huh? So it's a bit too early maybe to answer that question uh, yes. really concretely. What does it mean yeah, for the portfolio? At least uh, that's that's how we see it. That was why I was asking the question. We, we as KFW IPEX Bank have a close yeah, look on that issue. As we... on that issue. Sorry? Okay, yeah. we have a close uh, look on that yeah, question because we, we typically do long-term landing and you have a lock-in effect. So once you finance a ship, you might be in this transaction for 10 plus years. Of course, sometimes you have a balloon, but also the balloon you have to take care of and you have to find a proper structure to, to avoid problems by then. And um, I think there are two considerations I would to share, want to share with you in this context. One is, of course, um, to... Um, well, as given, given the mandate we have, we are looking very much on the export industry, either on the shipyards and the equipment suppliers, the engine suppliers, for instance. So we have a decent amount of exchange between those people who have more knowledge, knowledge of course, than us about technologies to come and how feasible they, they, they will be. So that is something, of course, we have to make up our mind and, and build up a decent knowledge base. The other element which is important is, um, of course, we're talking of assets, but ultimately we have corporates as clients. So it's again a matter of how diversified our clients are and how far-sighted their, their policy is. And ultimately, and this is also a benefit of our mandate, the, our core business, as, as Job also uh, explained it, it's, it's new bills and it's also retrofits. And retrofits, of course, should also be positive for, for, for the lifetime of a ship because it makes them more efficient and so yeah. on. So we, we have a close, a close look of, of that, but I think we can, we can structure it. No, that, that's very interesting. Well, we're, we are certainly seeing less new building financing take place, and that sort of suggests that uh, ship owners are hesitating until it becomes clearer which is going to be the winning technology, because there are several different types of winning technology, as I understand it, and there's no clear winner. So that may indicate um, the hesitation. Shall we? Yeah. Um, I'm again. I'm really sorry we haven't had our colleague Peter Zhao uh, join us. Sh shall we move on uh, finally for the last five minutes or so to talk about um, just like 2021 generally and, and um, what is going to be happening in, in the ship finance? We've already mentioned the decline in the number of new buildings on on that have been ordered so um can i go around each of you shall we start off with uh philip uh, as to talking generally um what 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 do you see with um the exception of esg which we've talked about um will you do you think we'll see change to finance terms um are you expecting a shipping downturn or are you 
um, are you positive for 2021? So, uh, Philip, let's let's hear from you first, and then we'll we'll go around the uh, the institutions. I think um, uh, first of all, our view is relatively positive, uh, short term and and mid term. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, what we talked about today, in the end, will lead to a kind of or is part of a mega trend. Uh, uh, which is the transfer of, of, of that industry into a new generation of vessels. And uh, the topic of ESG is, is, is key because uh, it will also, as I mentioned, for the investors be, be a challenge to find the right investments to make. And so from a very broad perspective, we see the shipping industry being well placed uh, for that for that also investor requirement to find new and attractive and ESG compliant investments. So from that very general perspective, positive. Secondly, um, the current markets are, um, uh, let's say, in a good mood. Uh, we had a proof of concept year 2020, and uh, not too much went wrong. And uh, as, as let's say the, borrow, the lenders who are active uh, have made their homeworks from the last crisis, I think uh, the portfolios uh, uh, by and large have, have uh, remained relatively solid. So we can also go out with that message and uh, let's say also internally but also externally yes. wherever you have to convince investors or stakeholders you can tell hey shipping has not done too too bad uh, last year and has has kind of approved. Yeah. Yeah, so it is that is positive and last maybe for us as Berenberg as we are maybe other than KFW and or uh, IBN focusing very much on the second hand uh, tonnage we don't see a reason for now to change that yeah um, we see that as as the backbone of the industry for the time being until the technology questions will be solved so no reason for us to exclude or to uh, not to not to find a second hand vessels obviously they have to go through that uh, 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 ramping up uh, impact assessment tests uh, and have to fulfill certain criteria. But we think that for, for the next five years, if not even 10 years, secondhand tonnage in a, in a compliant way will still be uh, something you, you would like to see also in ship finance. Thank you. Um, Jörg, would you like to speak next on those on 2021? Yeah, I'm uh, positive for 2021. Um, rem you know, after sort of after COVID uh, uh, um, economy globally, global trade should uh, come back. So demand for shipping and for commodities should uh, should turn back, and it is already happening. I think the supply side this time is indeed controlled. It's it's in some sectors even going down with increased scrapping. Um, and a very very low order book so um, we might be in for very high charter rates actually in some of the sectors and uh, I think that's needed because money needs to come back into the into the sector to make all the investments happening for uh, for the next generation uh, ships on the water um, and don't forget also the investments that we can make in retrofitting uh, the existing fleet if we make uh, the 50, 60,000 ships uh, on the water, if we make them uh, 10, 20, 30 percent cleaner very, very soon by retrofitting, by putting wind propulsion, by putting air lubrication, by reducing speed, other, other propellers, uh, coatings, what have you, you can do so much on the ship by investing in the, in the ship on the water. If we do that, we already achieve a lot, and that is what the industry is needed, and money is needed for that, and that's why we need a good charter rate. The other factor is I see more consolidation coming up, and I see a, a lively M&A market. I see uh, a lively equity raising, public and private, and and the bond market coming back. So um, positive for 21, 20, and and beyond. Thank you. Uh, Holger, your turn to finish off. Uh, did it come off mute? Uh, oh. Well, I share the views of the two colleagues. I'm also positive. We see much more discipline in the, mar in the market than we used to see. And if COVID has one positive, it uh, told us that ships are, by any dimension, they are lifelines for the societies, for the economies. And with the um, 
well, the, the lessons learned that you should maybe diversify your supply chains more. We see more tonnage miles maybe, and that's also good for shipping. So after, I would say, some second thoughts in, in Q, Q, Q2 in 2020, when everybody was scratching its head, well, are, going, are we going to see another crisis also in shipping? Now the picture is much better and much more positive. That's terrific. Well, guys, I want to thank you. Uh, for I think, uh, as a lawyer, I'd like to please, Jonathan. Thank you, Matt. No, I, I just wanted to thank you guys. Uh, I was just saying, as, as a lawyer, uh, we, we 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 see that, and it, it's. Um, I think we are very positive as well. So I was very pleased to see the three uh, clients um, uh, being positive. I'm very sorry, um, ICBC couldn't join. That's, you know, the technology is one of our challenges and it continues to be our challenge. So let me hand over to Matt uh, to, to round up. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jonathan. And as always, thanks for running a great panel. You do a really a terrific job of kind of framing these topics. And um, I just want to thank all the panelists. You know, I, I, um, I found the discussion to be super constructive and you all uh, articulate the position very well. I mean, Philip, I think you said it right. It's it's very important and it's very fast moving. But ultimately, you are the stewards of capital for your shareholders, right? I mean, you have shareholders and, and institutional investors and, you know, so it's you're taking their guidance. Um, you know, the, the retrofits, I think, is an important topic. You know, we're actually having a workshop on, next week on financing retrofits together with uh, KFW because um, we agree that's actionable it has attractive returns and it's something that we can we can do now so i want to thank you guys again I, I, as i said earlier i think these discussions you know they do advance the the sort of thinking here in a very complex time and i really appreciate your being involved with us we're going to take a break now and reconvene in half an hour um and we're going to turn to the capital markets in the next session and uh we're going to talk with a couple of issuers in the bond market um, and also uh, two groups that are doing um, ESG rating um, services to help investors kind of evaluate and understand uh, the risks that, that they're taking. So thanks again. I hope you can join us uh, for the rest of the session and uh, look forward to seeing everyone uh, soon. Thank you. Right. Bye. Right. Thank you.